going to talk to you about something that's very close to my heart. It's on how we learn. All of us are learners. We like to learn all the time. We grow, we thrive on learning and on finding out new things. And we start learning when we are kids. What do children do? They mess around. You give them a pot of paint and it lands all over the floor. Now they're just messing around. But is that all they're doing? My six-year-old daughter loved to use the sewing machine. She sits there with um, a whole bunch of um, cloths. She runs it this way, that way. She doesn't really care too much about how what she makes looks like, but she has a whole bunch of fun doing that. And obviously she likes to create a big mess. But, but is that what she's doing? Now, when a child is messing around, when all of us are messing around, there is inherently a lot of learning that happens. Making is learning. When we make, when we use our hands, when we make mistakes, when we fail, we learn. Now, um, at the Science Center, we have been working very, uh, very much on um, getting kids to learn through making. We set up environments where children come together and they try to tinker. They get their hands dirty, they learn how to use tools. And sometimes what they make doesn't work, which is fine. But what happens at the end of that is that they leave with a certain sense of pride, um, a certain sense that they have accomplished something, that they've, they go off feeling good, feeling empowered. Um, here's a bunch of kids, we had a wading pool, they were making boats. Um, at some point, they started blowing the boats around. They started finding out what happens when you kind of start splashing the water, and how do the boats move that way. Um, they're just messing around, but there's a lot of learning happening there. They learn about floating, sinking, density, um, wind power, energy, so many things happening there. But that doesn't just stop with young kids. We've got older children, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds coming in, and they start tinkering. They um, play around, they mess around, they work on projects. Um, they try to hack remote control cars and make them into weird things. So this, this boy here is working on an R2-D2, and uh, he's, he built this gigantic R2-D2 that was about this high, and he stuck it on top of an RC car and tried to control it, and the whole thing collapsed because it was unstable. Then he tinkered again, and uh, he got it and finally he got working for about three seconds and then it collapsed again. <laughs> and it just went on and on until he, he, he did something that, that he was happy with. Adults. We think that once we get into the workforce, we, we kind of stop learning, but we don't really do that, right? So once you have a, a, an experience to play, when you have an experience to, to solder a couple of things, you know, like we, we, we see adults all the time and they say, Oh, I used to do this when I was in school and I've not done this for 25 years. I would love to start soldering again. You know. um, seniors, 60-year-old, 70-year-old people who have probably never put together a circuit. And uh, they start playing around with copper tapes, batteries, LEDs. They leave with some kind of an understanding of circuits, but, but more than anything, they leave with the feeling that they have accomplished something. They've learned something. Making is not just about learning. It is, to us, to humans, it's like breathing. It's a fundamental part of us because to be human is to make. Imagine a child reading a book, a storybook. Think of your favorite book, Harry Potter. You don't read Harry Potter because it helps you in your English composition. You read Harry Potter because it transports you. It transports you into a world where you are, you are in control of. You are inside that world with Harry. You're inside his adventures. When you are making, it transports you. It moves you into a world where you are your boss. You learn what you want to learn, when you want to learn, how you want to learn it. So how does this look then in a makerspace? When we do a maker 
space, we get the children opportunities to play. Let's see how that looks. Okay, we seem to have a technical difficulty over here. And while you're sorting that out, I'll just... Okay. So, in an environment where we learn by making, there are a number of big ideas. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the big ideas here. The first big idea is that when a child learns by making, the child takes the lead. So when we do programs where we invite children to make, we have all the materials and tools available for them but we don't tell them what to do. We have facilitators around, but they don't teach. The kids just mess around. The second big idea is when you give a child a tool, you teach them and you tell them that you trust them. You empower a child. When you give a child a toy, you tell them that they are children. When you give them a tool, you tell them that you trust them, that they can handle it. That's a very, very powerful thing in the hands of a child. At the Science Center in our maker workshops, we've got children as young as five handling a soldering iron. And we've never had an injury. Because when they handle a soldering iron, they are aware, they are conscious. The third big idea over here is that there are people out there, there are members of the community who are experts in the content. Whatever you teach, whatever I can teach a child as an educator is only so much. It's limited on the knowledge that I have. But if I'm able to harness the power of the community, I would be able to teach them a lot more because the members of the community are the people, the makers are the people who are working with these tools day in and day out. The fourth big idea. So that girl who's right over there um, in the right is called Minakshi. She's 18 and she's one of our facilitators. Now you see, if I'm teaching a workshop and, I've, and I'm over there handling a, um, a power drill, it doesn't strike so much of a rapport with the people because I'm old. I've got an engineering degree. Now, when Minakshi is there and she is using a power drill, everyone says, hey, 
here is a girl who's not too much older than me, and she can do this, and therefore I can do this. The big idea over here is that we always have facilitators who are learning themselves. And when they are learning themselves, they pass to the children not just the content that they're teaching, but also the attitude to learn. The next big idea over here is that in a maker space, remember I said that people don't teach? We give the children the space. We give them the space to get things wrong. Because the only way you can get something right is to get it wrong first. They need to make a mistake, and we give them plenty of time to make a mistake. So over here, I've got the children, they're trying to make a car. Now obviously the body of the car is too heavy for what they're going to use for wheels, which are really small motors. Now it is, all of us as teachers know that this is not going to work. We can jump in and say, stop, this is not going to work. But what does the child leave with? Whereas, if you step back, let him make a mistake and walk through the mistake and find out for himself. He would remember that forever, the concepts that he learns. The big idea, this is probably the biggest idea of all, is that in a makerspace you see people doing projects. Now the projects have to have a meaning, have to have a value, but they shouldn't have a value to the world. You're not expecting the kids in a makerspace to solve problems like climate change or world hunger. You expect them to solve problems that have a meaning to them. I have, this is one of the student projects that came out of our makerspace. Um, this student is making a pair of spectacles which has a windshield wiper attached to them. Obviously it's very important to him because when he steps out of a bus, his glasses get fogged and he needs something to clean them. It is... <laughs> so, now, what I loved about this project was the way he went on, because he had such a great ownership on this project. The first thing he did was he sacrificed one of my pair of safety glasses to, <laughs> to attach um, motors on them and try it out. And then he decided that safety glasses don't quite cut it, they're not very stylish. So he decided to 3D design the glasses. He took it to the fab lab, got it 3D printed, and then he did the same thing. He took some time and trouble to, to make his brushes look aesthetically pleasing, and then he had a project that was really interesting. This is my daughter. She put this up as a project for Make a Fan. Um, the way she did this was, um, again, she wanted a project that, that had value to her. And she decided to make a fencing costume, which was electronically linked to a computer using a makey makey. Now, uh, it had value to her, because she learned a lot of things. She learned sewing, she learned electronic circuits, she learned programming, but more than anything, even though this was a, not a project that had a real practical application, this was a project that she had great ownership on, and she felt a great amount of satisfaction working on this project. Now, the big idea here is that a makerspace is something that children need to be exposed to consistently. It is not enough that they come once to the science center or once in a, in a couple of months or once a week to go to a fab lab or a session in school. No, this has to be part of your daily lives. Just like how reading has to be part of your daily lives if you want to develop a habit of reading. And so what are we doing? We are trying to work with moms to work alongside the children when they come to the science center, we say, okay, you handle the power tool. This is as new to you as it is to the child. So learn. Sometimes dads also. And slowly over the years, we've formed a community of families who have tried to make the idea of making and tinkering part of their everyday lives. So, um, as we do our programs, we always encourage our parents not just to stop at the programs. We encourage them to allow the kids to tinker at home, to take apart stuff, to blow things up a little bit. You know. And we say that there are many reasons why children have to get into a makerspace. One, because in a makerspace, a child learns to learn by himself, for himself. Two, a child in a makerspace is empowered to solve his or her own problems. 
And three, in a makerspace, people don't give you the answers. You're uncomfortable, you solve your problems. So you get used to the idea of being uncomfortable. So when you go out in the real world, you're a little bit more prepared to deal with your problems. So as you walk out, if you're a parent, I want you to think about this. When you give a child a tool, when you give him a toy, don't give him a toy to play with. Give him a toy that he can tear apart. When you give your child a tool, don't be afraid for him. Give him the tool so that it shows him that you trust him. When you give your child some materials, give them the materials not so that they consume them. Give them the materials so that they create with these materials. When a child starts creating with materials, the materials take on a completely different form. A fan and a brush are no longer a fan and a brush. They become a robot. When you ask your child to make something, don't ask them to make something to solve a problem. Ask them to make something because it is hard fun. It's hard, but it is fun. And that's how they learn. Thank you very much.